I'm going to introduce the moderator, Charles Johnson. He is the president of the Southern Regional Council, which began the Book Awards following L. Smith's death. So um, without any further introduction, I'm going to let him take over, because there are a lot of you today. Good afternoon. You know, when other Southern liberals were charting a cautious course on racial change, Lillian Smith boldly and persistently called for an end to segregation. For such boldness, she was often scorned by more moderate Southerners, threatened by arsonists, and denied the critical attention which she deserved as a writer. Yet she continued to write and speak for improved human relations and social justice throughout her life. And after her death, beginning in 1968, the Southern Regional Council has presented an award in her name, recognizing authors whose books are in the best tradition of moral vision and literary merit presenting in the best light, the South, its people, its problems, and its promise. Uh, for the last several years, this award has been presented in a partnership, which has included the University of Georgia Libraries, which house the Lillian Smith Papers, the Decatur Book Festival, which uh, presents the, the Decatur, the Georgia Center for the Book, which presents the Decatur Book Festival. And this year, we're, we're joined by Piedmont College. This year, we had 42 books that were nominated. So as you know, this enterprise would not have worked at all without some hard work on the part of some very talented and dedicated jurors. And I want to take a minute to recognize them. There are Mary Twining, Baird, who's right here, Merrill Penson, James Taylor, uh, Vicki Crawford, and Marcy Johnson, who's uh, not with us. We want to thank them. Will not you join me in thanking them for, for their work? It, it, it gives me pleasure this time to do something I haven't had the opportunity before, because since he got this position, he has not been with us for this occasion. But it's my pleasure to present to you the university librarian for the University of Georgia, Toby Graham. That's pretty good. Librarians don't usually get whoots, so I, I uh, <laughs> appreciate that. Um, and it is, it is a privilege and a pleasure for the University of Georgia Libraries to partner with, with Charles and the Southern, Region, Southern Regional Council with uh, the Georgia Center for the Book and now with, with uh, Piedmont uh, College in, in uh, administering the, the Lillian Smith Book Awards. And, and we certainly have a special welcome this year for Craig Amerson and appreciate your being with us. And President Melichamp uh, from Piedmont was with us a little bit earlier and, and they've been uh, great sponsors already. As Lee Formwalt explains to us in looking back, moving forward, the civil rights movement in Southwest Georgia wasn't limited to the more well-known events that occurred there in the 1960s. It's rather a movement that began with the arrival of enslaved people in the early 19th century, and it is a history that he brings right up to the present day. And in bestowing this award, the Lillian Smith Book Awards jury is commending Professor Formwalt for doing justice to this long history of struggle through a narrative that is compelling, that is instructive, that is often heartbreaking for sharing with us an intensely local history with national significance. Having said that, it, it was the Albany's, it was Albany's citywide campaign in 61 and 62 when events came to head to a head in southwest Georgia and when the region received widespread public attention. And Professor Wormwalt, Formwalt is particularly effective in conveying a sense of this period. The mass meetings at Mount Zion and Shiloh churches, the conviction of local leaders, the marches, the boycotts, the freedom rides, the young women locked in the Leesburg stockade, the brutal attack on the pregnant Marion King, 
He writes of the music of the movement that lent unity and courage in the face of great adversity. And who better to relate these events and many others than the former director of the Albany Civil Rights Institute and longtime professor of history at Albany State University, Lee Formwalt. All the better that the proceeds from the sale of Looking Back, Moving Forward will go to the Albany Civil Rights Institute to help to support that institution in its effort to educate this and future generations on the civil rights struggle in Southwest Georgia. And I hope you'll keep that in mind in the book sale after the program. So Professor Warm Formwalt, it is my pleasure to present to you the Lillian Smith Book Award. truly honored and humbled to receive this award today. <clears throat> when I look at the competition this year and at the previous winners, I am in awe that my work on the history of that dark southwest corner of the state of Georgia is recognized and graced with this prize named after the courageous woman whose writing and work challenged segregation in the Jim Crow South. Looking back, moving forward, tells the story of the Albany Movement and the Southwest Georgia Movement. For some people, that means the years 1961 to 62, when Martin Luther King went to Albany and participated in the movement. With his involvement, the Albany Movement came to be part of the larger national civil rights movement, which many people consider to have begun either in 1954 with the Brown versus Board of Education Supreme Court decision declaring public school segregation unconstitutional, or in 1955 with the Montgomery bus boycott when the young minister, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., emerged as a civil rights leader of national renown. The movement is often considered to have concluded in 1964-65 with the passage of the Civil and Voting Rights Acts, or in 1968 with the assassination of Martin Luther King Jr. in Memphis, Tennessee. Many historians are rethinking the chronological boundaries of the movement, which make it a 1950s and 1960s phenomenon. Instead, they propose what they call the long civil rights movement, which began before 1954 and did not end in 1968 but continues right up to the present. In the long civil rights movement, we look to those earlier and later attempts by African Americans and others to assert their human and civil rights. Some would argue that the civil rights movement began in the 1930s. Others go back to the beginning of the 20th century when the NAACP was founded. Still others go back to emancipation and reconstruction in the 19th century. And others argue that the movement began with slavery and those enslaved persons who resisted their bondage. In other words, most historians agree that the freedom struggle for civil rights was not limited to two decades in the middle of the 20th century, but has a long history that goes back to before our nation's founding and continues right up through today. This book tells the story of the long Southwest Georgia movement, going all the way back to the earliest white and African American settlers in Southwest Georgia. Greed and white privilege on the one hand, and resistance and yearning for freedom and equality on the other, have been continual themes in Southwest Georgia history in the last two centuries. Quickly summarized, the story of its early years consists of the white man defeating the red man in the Creek War of 1813-14, 
and taking his land to grow the white gold of that day, cotton. To clear the land and to plant and cultivate the crop, he brought in the enslaved black man and laid in southwest Georgia what W.E.B. Du Bois called the cornerstone of the cotton kingdom. That kingdom, built on African-American slavery, came crashing down with emancipation at the conclusion of the Civil War in 1865. There followed, in the brief hopeful years of Reconstruction in Southwest Georgia, a struggle to make African-American freedom real. With the spotty support of the federal government, black men by the hundreds elected African-American men to represent them in the state legislature. They built their own churches, schools, and social institutions. Federal support of the experiment in African-American freedom did not last long. The bonds of race were strong. White Northerners and Southerners reconciled as the 19th century ended, ushering in the long, dark years of Jim Crow, and segregation became the law of the land south of the Mason-Dixon line. White supremacy was reinforced by law and by extra-legal violence the worst of which was lynching. As during slavery and Reconstruction, African Americans resisted the system of oppression. Some left Southwest Georgia. Others organized and laid the groundwork for the Albany Civil Rights Movement, which burst on the national scene in 1961. The eyes of the nation and the world were on Southwest Georgia and witnessed the largest direct action community protests at that time in American history. Key players in igniting the Albany movement were Charles Sherrod and the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee and high school and Albany State College students. Martin Luther King came in 1961 and left in 1962, but Sherrod and Snick stayed. Their stories flesh out the narrative of the Southwest Georgia movement in the 1960s. Once again, the federal government allied itself with the African American liberation cause, but it was local people of color who went to court and in county after county in the region brought the white power structure kicking and screaming into the modern world of equal rights and diversity. The struggle for freedom and equality continues in the 21st century as whites continue to avoid true public school integration and wield economic power in their own interests. One thing that continues to inspire contemporary freedom fighters is the story of how their predecessors challenged oppression. This book had its origins in the 1980s and 1990s when I was teaching at Albany State and researching and writing about 19th century Doherty County. In the 1990s, I got involved in the effort to turn the old and no longer used Mount Zion Baptist Church into a civil rights museum. We restored the front half of the church to the way it was in 1961-62 during the heyday of the Albany movement. In the back half of the church, were the museum exhibits. The $1.2 million renovation was completed in 1998, and the museum opened on the 37th anniversary of the founding of the Albany Movement in November 1961. Our dream for a new building with separate exhibit space next to the church was realized in 2008 when the $4 million facility was dedicated as the new Albany Civil Rights Institute, or ACRI. In the meantime, I had left Albany in 1999 to become executive director of the Organization of American Historians in Bloomington, Indiana. When I retired from that position in 2009, I got a phone call from ACRI. And before I knew it, I was back in Albany running our beloved new Civil Rights Institute. I wasn't there long when the editor of a slick, glossy, photo-rich community magazine 
proposed that we put together a souvenir book that ACRI visitors could buy, which would tell the story of the Albany movement. We raised $25,000 to cover the cost of making the book so that all the sales proceeds would benefit ACRI. We had difficulty finding a writer, and the project remained unfinished when I retired and returned to Indiana at the end of 2011. The following summer, I was diagnosed with Parkinson's disease, and I decided that while I was still able, I would just visit those places that I had always wanted to see, Italy, Greece, Machu Picchu, and the Galapagos Islands. I went to Italy in May of 2013, and while I was in Greece four months later, I got an email from ACRI Director Frank Wilson asking me about the souvenir book project. When I got home, I explained that he needed to find a writer for the book. Within 10 days, I was signing a contract <laughs> to write the book over the next four months before I headed down to Machu Picchu. Having researched and written so much on 19th century Southwest Georgia history, and having written the ACRI docent's presentation on the movement, I was able to crank out a chapter every week to nine days. For their feedback, I sent drafts out to former SNCC workers, Penny Patch, Pete Delisavoy, and Jack Chatfield, to former Albany Movement President, Dr. William Anderson, to Julian Bond, and to historians Susan O'Donovan, Emily Crosby, Hassan Jeffries, and Jamil Zeneldon. Sadly, we lost Jack Chatfield and Julian Bond this year, but both lived long enough to see the book before they passed. Jamil recognized the publication as more than a souvenir book and offered the help of the Georgia Humanities Council in promoting it to a wider audience. Kathy Cowdery did a superb job in designing and laying out the book, and Rich Weikert read every word of every draft and provided day in and day out support. And with us today are others who supported me over the years. I'd like to introduce you to my mother, Claire Formwald. Ninety years old. She's been my support for the last 65 years. My sisters, Debbie McFerrin and Kim Mistovich, and their husbands are with me, too. And I'd like to thank, thank my colleague, Susan McGrath, and Frank Wilson, who made this project finally happen. To all of you, thank you very much. the enviable task of introducing Andrew Marinus, who has been committed to the interaction among individuals, ethnic groups, and sports for a long time. He was awarded the Fred Russell Grantland Rice Sports Writing Scholarship, which is awarded uh, to entering freshmen at Vanderbilt University who are planning to make sports writing their career through the good offices of the Thoroughbred Racing Association. <laughs> he wrote a paper in an African-American history class, uh, and the rest was history, as you might say. Uh, in his senior year in 1992, he won the Alexander Award, and I thought you might like to know what that is. Uh, it uh, is an American Bar Association Council for Racial and Ethnic Diversity in the Educational Pipeline in the Continuum, Preschool to High School to College to Law School, which sounds pretty impressive. <laughs> and what a good idea, a pipeline concept get them young and work them right through. Um, I thought that was interesting when I learned about it. 
Uh, so there was a, a Vanderbilt uh, connection and then other uh, institutions that came in to the mix. Um, he, uh, he continued his association with Vanderbilt for five years in the athletic department as the associate director of media relations. He took up the challenge to serve as media relations manager for the first year of the Tampa Bay Devil Rays. He came back to Nashville to join the staff at McNeely, Piggott, and Fox public relations firm where he remains today. His community service includes past president of the Nashville chapter of Reviving Baseball in Inner Cities, which gives us the letter, uh, which gives us the acronym of RBI. For you baseball fans, you will know that that's, that's really cute. <laughs> And presently, he is a advisory board member of the Albert Pujols Family Foundation. And uh, the emphasis on family in the title means not only by family, but for families. And I quote, to help those living with Down syndrome and impoverished families in the Dominican Republic. Uh, Pujols was uh, the first, is the first baseman for the Angels. <laughs> I am ignorance itself when it comes to sports. Okay, he is committed to the relationship between profession and community, and today is being awarded the Lillian Smith Prize for highlighting the bravery and struggle of Perry Wallace, who persevered in basketball and law courts as a shining pioneer. Thanks for that introduction, Mary. That's the most baseball that's ever been worked into an introduction. I appreciate that. <laughs> I can't believe it for the <laughs> All right. Uh, as Lee said, I'm also honored and humbled uh, to be here today when I consider um, the scholarly work that uh, you know people like Lee have put in to their books and the other books that were nominated and the, the list of impressive authors that have won this award in the past. Uh, it's just incredible, I, especially when you consider uh, at least for me, a year ago, I wasn't a published author. This is my first book, uh, so every experience for me is brand new, and um, I appreciate, approach with the greatest sense of appreciation. Uh, this day is certainly at the top of the list, and I'm really excited that my kids, four-year-old Eliza, Eliza, wave, <laughs> and two-year-old Charlie are sitting in the back of the room. Uh, my wife's here in the front, my in-laws Doug and Kathy are here, uh, my friends Johnma and Jack and the Trochis are here, and uh, Perry Wallace, some members of Perry Wallace's family are here, including his sister Annie right here in the front row. There's also another special person in the crowd that I'll mention in a minute. Um, thank you to the judges and to all the great sponsors of this award. I deeply, deeply appreciate this. Um, at the same time, I'm personally thankful, though I completely recognize that this award is not about me. It's about the uh, strength and courage and determination of the person I was very fortunate uh, to have the chance to write about, uh, Perry Wallace. And what I consider the greatest aspect of this award is that Perry Wallace is getting the um, recognition as a civil rights figure, sports and civil rights figure of the caliber of a Jackie Robinson, which I think is totally the case. And in some cases, Perry's journey was more difficult than Jackie Robinson's when you consider the time and the place that Perry was a pioneer in the Deep South in the late 1960s. 
And most people have heard Jackie Robinson's story. Very few people have ever heard Perry Wallace's story. And for those of you in here who don't know anything about Perry Wallace, briefly, he was the Jackie Robinson of the Deep South. He was the first African-American basketball player, varsity basketball player in the Southeastern Conference, uh, first uh, black athlete in the SEC in any sport that played a full career. Uh, he went on to attend law school at Columbia University. He's today he's a professor of law at American University. Uh, just an incredible person. And in some ways, it's, uh, it's a shame that it took 45 years after he graduated for someone to tell his story. But I feel very fortunate that I had the chance to do it. Uh, this project for me began uh, when I was 19 years old in 1989. Uh, as Mary mentioned, I came to Vanderbilt on a sports writing scholarship. I was a history major. And I happened to read a student magazine article about the first game that Perry Wallace and his one African-American teammate his freshman year, Godfrey Dillard, uh, played at Mississippi State University, a road game in Starkville. And the racism that they encountered in the first half of the game was so vicious that at halftime, Perry and Godfrey, these two young, strong athletes, held hands as they sat on the bench in the locker room to gain the strength to go back out there and play second half of the ball game. So someone who was interested in sports and history, that's what first grabbed my attention. I asked my professor, uh, Dr. Jones, if it was acceptable to write about sports in college. Um, I didn't know if that was cool at a school like Vanderbilt. And uh, she said, yes, of course, go for it. And so I found Perry, who was then a professor in Baltimore, and interviewed him uh, for a paper that I wrote for that class. And so I also understand this is the first time that Lillian Smith Awards have recognized a book that deals with sports. You know, I had that same question, would an awards like this, you know, accept a book about sports? And so I'm really uh, <laughs> proud that you did. And I think that, you know, sports plays, for better or worse, such an important role in American culture and has been a part of, uh, you know, um, certainly the segregation in, in the South, the story of the South. The sports has always been a, a, in a pivotal uh, role in perpetuating that, and people like Perry and Godfrey helped bring that down. So, you know, thank you for taking a chance on a, on a book about sports. Um, that said, I set out to write a book that was about a lot more than just sports. And Perry Wallace himself used sports as a means to an end. In his case, he saw a basketball scholarship as his ticket out of the South, his way out of uh, segregated Nashville. And he had his sights set on receiving a scholarship somewhere uh, in the Big Ten, uh, northern schools like Michigan or Iowa, Wisconsin, uh, or the Pac-10. He was recruited by John Wooden out at UCLA. And actually, the reason that he ended up staying home, he grew up in Nashville, he stayed home to go attend Vanderbilt, was not necessarily to make history as a pioneer, but because he said he wasn't going to trade one plantation for another. He wasn't going to leave. Uh, Nashville only to end up being exploited for his athletic ability at a school that uh, told him, don't worry about going to class or we'll find the easiest classes for you. You're just here to play basketball. And so he made the decision uh, after having a recruiting trip to Vanderbilt where he was impressed by the engineering school and that the players actually were going to class that despite the fact that he would be a pioneer, he was going to come do it so he could get a good education and play big time college basketball. Um, for me, I use basketball as a means to an end as well, as a way to enter the South and to um, tell a story of Nashville, which has so many different civil rights angles you could go with, um, through the vehicle of this smart young teenager who was making history as a pioneer on the basketball court, but that was traveling to all these places in the Deep South, like. Tuscaloosa, Alabama, where the governor had just been standing in front of the schoolhouse door, you know, or Ole Miss, just a few years after James Meredith was there. Uh, but the thing was, uh, Perry didn't make this decision alone. There was another uh, smart, young African-American basketball player who made the decision to come to Vanderbilt. He came from Detroit, Michigan, and he's in the crowd today. He lives uh, part-time in the city of Atlanta, and I'm so happy that Godfrey Dillard is here today. Godfrey, would you just please stand up? <laughs> mm -hmm. 
thank you for being here, Godfrey. And Godfrey's story uh, is told in the book, and it takes a different path than Perry's. Uh, but Godfrey's been a huge success in life. He's argued before the U.S. Supreme Court. He's been a diplomat in Africa, and he just recently ran for Secretary of State in the state of Michigan. So again, thank you for being here, Godfrey. Um, in receiving this award, is the first time I ever read a book by Lillian Smith. I read Killers of the Dream just a couple weeks ago. And she starts the book by saying, even the children knew the South was in trouble. No one had to tell them. And as a father of two young kids, I was really struck uh, just by this notion of introducing children in the way that uh, the toxic environment of segregation affected um, black and white kids at the time. And uh, in the book, I talk a lot about Perry's uh, life, his, his childhood in Nashville, and the, the dangers that he faced. Uh, one time, standing on a street corner to catch a bus, a carload of white teenagers pulled around the corner, with pointing a gun out the window at his face. He's just trying to go home from school. Uh, he had to walk through a white neighborhood to get to the black elementary school, and kids would pick fights with him almost every day on his way to elementary school. Uh, think about him dealing with sort of the daily realities of living in a, a Jim Crow town where he sat down in the first seat he saw on the bus, not knowing he couldn't sit there, and his mom had to whisk him away to the back of the bus. Um, his family lived right across the street from North High School, which was a white school, and so Perry would just have to stand against the fence looking at these kids having fun playing on the playground at a school that he wasn't allowed to go to. Uh, but also about the determination that he still showed in the face of this society that was sort of designed to limit him. He didn't let it limit him. So. Uh, even in kindergarten, he was showing the signs of uh, character that would see him through the most difficult days as a pioneer in the SEC. His sister, Jessie, told me that she showed up to pick him up from school, and the teacher had left the room, and all the other kids in the classroom were going berserk, running around, bouncing off the walls, and there was one kid still sitting at his desk doing his work, doing the right thing, and that was her brother, Perry Wallace. Um, Perry's mom, uh, would bring home magazines from her job as a cleaning lady at office buildings in downtown Nashville and show all the Wallace children pictures in these magazines and say, there's a bigger world out there. You know, this is what you can aspire to. Um, and Perry considered the slam dunk his freedom song. He said this town that he lived in uh, was dark in many ways and, again, designed to limit him. But on the basketball court, he found his freedom soaring through the air. And so even at this playground across the street where he wasn't supposed to be on weekends, he would go practice his basketball. And that's where he learned how to slam dunk. Uh, and it, all of this led him straight into the heart of the uh, civil rights movement. <clears throat> so Perry started kindergarten in 1954, obviously year of Brown versus Board. Uh, he was a young kid when Emmett Till was murdered and was around the same age, was profoundly influenced by that. In 1960, the lunch counter sit-ins were taking place in Nashville. And Perry would sneak from his parents' house in North Nashville downtown to watch the sit-ins and watch these students with his own eyes. He entered high school, Pearl High School in Nashville, the week after Martin Luther King's I Have a Dream speech. He was in high school for the passage of the Voting Rights Act and the Civil Rights Act. And what he told me was that he could feel the country was changing and there would be opportunities there for him and members of his uh, class, class of 66, that hadn't been there for their older siblings or certainly for their parents, and he needed to be prepared to take advantage of these opportunities, and he was. So he accepts this dangerous assignment to integrate the SEC and come to school at Vanderbilt. And one uh, saying that Perry has today, he'll say that all of us can treat each other in any of three ways. We can treat each other well, we can treat each other poorly, or we can not be treated at all. And Perry was treated well by some people. He was treated poorly by even more people. <clears throat> but what he would say is that the most difficult aspect of his experience was this feeling of not being treated at all, of feeling invisible on this campus, being denied his humanity. And there's a passage in um, Killers of the Dream where uh, Lillian Smith talks about she's talking to a, a white girl in a, a theater setting, and the girl says to her, I understand that segregation is wrong, and I don't want to hate people, but I don't want people to hate me either. And I'm afraid to speak out because I really don't want to make waves um, and have my friends disagree with me. And just being a little bit afraid to challenge the status quo. <coughs> Excuse me. In that sense of not speaking up is something that uh, happened quite often in Perry's experience. I opened the book with a scene where his old teammate Bob Warren 
who had played basketball at Vanderbilt with in the late 60s. Uh, Bob Warren didn't understand at all what his teammate was going through back then, but he played professional basketball for about 10 years, where most of his teammates were African American. And he, he told me in an interview that that's when it finally began to dawn on him, oh my gosh, what hell must my teammate Perry have been going through as we made these road trips uh, through the Deep South. And so one day Bob Warren happened to be on a business trip in Washington, D.C., where Perry Wallace teaches. And he unannounced took a cab over to American University Law School, the elevator up to the fourth floor, and walked into Perry Wallace's office and shook his hand and said, Perry, please forgive me. There's so much more I could have done. And that scene is three-fourths of a page. It's the first chapter of the book. And since the book has come out, Perry and I have both received countless emails and calls from people who are contemporaries of Perry's basically saying the same thing. That, oh my gosh, there's so much more they could have done. And when I go speak at schools about this book, it's my message to the to the kids is don't end up as one of those people that takes 40 years to realize there's people around you that need uh, you to reach out a, a hand, you know, um, do that now while you have the opportunity. And the final thing I wanted to say, uh, also in the book, Lillian Smith says that uh, words can ar arouse a conscience. And it seems like an obvious thing to say, that words can arouse a conscience. But the point she's making is that too often people don't express those words. And the context that she was talking about was newspapers, even liberal papers at the time in the South, being afraid to speak out against civil rights because they were concerned that it would only make things worse. <coughs> and in that regard, the most courageous thing that Perry Wallace ever did wasn't going out on the basketball court at Mississippi State. It was giving an interview to the Tennessean in Nashville the day after his last game, where he said that he felt a moral obligation to tell the truth about what his experience had been like, even though he knew people weren't going to be ready to hear this truth, that he would be run out of town if he gave this interview. Here he had been a high school valedictorian, engineering major at Vandy, all SEC basketball player, three-time state champion, high school basketball player, setting himself up for a bright future in his hometown. But if he knew he, if he gave this interview, he would never have a career in this town. But he gave the interview anyway. And unfortunately, he was, he was correct. The day after the story ran, people weren't ready to hear it. I talked to the editors of the paper. They told me that the phones rang off the hook that day with Vanderbilt fans calling to cancel their subscriptions to the paper, calling Perry Wallace ungrateful and wishing him good riddance out of town. But uh, my greatest satisfaction with this book is that his words have aroused the conscience. It just it took 45 years, unfortunately. Um, and Perry will say today that reconciliation without the truth is just acting, uh, which I think is a pretty interesting phrase. And um, my, uh, my hope is that this book represents the truth. And if I did nothing else but just listen to what Godfrey and Perry had to tell me, uh, it, it would certainly be the truth. So Perry came back to Nashville the first week of December when the book came out, and he was concerned what sort of reception he would get. We haven't, he hadn't been back uh, in any significant way since 1970, when he was basically run out of town. He said, we're entering a hot environment. What's this going to be like? But it turned out to be great. They were uh, in a room that sort of like this. It seats 250 people. 400 people showed up. We had 150 people across the hall. After we both spoke, they lined up for two hours uh, to see Perry and to shake his hand and have him sign their books. And I was sitting next to Perry. And some people were asking for my signature. Everyone was asking for Perry's signature. <laughs> And so I was observing what was happening, and person after person would come up, and they had bloodshot eyes, or they were still crying, and they were just like Bob Warren. They were coming up one after another to express this regret. They hadn't done more to understand what Perry was going through at the time. They were finally beginning to understand it after hearing his story and, and reading the book. Um, since then, the city government in Nashville has uh, honored Perry at a Metro Council meeting. The state government has issued a proclamation in his honor. Congressman uh, Cohen from Memphis has read something into the congressional record. When Perry came back to town, the police chief and the mayor were the first two people to greet him, which I thought was very symbolic uh, in a positive way. And his story sort of becoming known and arousing a conscience, I feel like, is culminated today with it being included in this great litany of, of books that have received the Lillian Smith Book Award. So uh, thank you so much for honoring uh, Perry Godfrey, strong inside. I'm incredibly grateful. Thank you.
Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Craig Amison. Uh, it is my distinct pleasure and privilege to serve as the director of the Lillian E. Smith Center of Piedmont College, which functions as an educational and cultural center for the college and also as an artist retreat. The center is located at the former home of Lillian Smith in Clayton, Georgia. Um, I wanted to uh, just mention a couple of things, and then, then, we're, then we're out of here. I'm the closer. I know you're, you're, you're saying 30 seconds. I can see you back there, Joe. <laughs> Um, I wanted to remind you um, of something that's coming up at, um, at Piedmont College, which is kind of exciting. Seventy years after the Broadway production of Lillian Smith's Strange Fruit, um, there's a readaptation of that play uh, that, is going to be, that, is, that has been written and is going to be directed by a New York um, playwright and director named Tom Fogarty, and he is working with our students on campus right now, and that production will be October 4th, uh, 1st through the 4th on our campus at Demarest, Georgia, which is about an hour north of Athens, if you need to know where that is. So you can get tickets to that. It's very, very exciting to see that back on the stage again after all this time. Um, Fifteen years ago, a visionary group of relatives and friends of Lillian Smith got together and formed a nonprofit foundation to start this artist retreat. And then in 2013, that foundation donated the center to Piedmont College, which is now the proud steward of it. So that's how we come into play here. And it is an honor for Piedmont College to be a partner in sponsoring the Lillian Smith Book Awards, a program with such a rich history and one that is affiliated with individuals and organizations who, like Lillian Smith, understand that the only way to leave the future open is to believe in something not yet proved and to underwrite it with our lives. We congratulate this year's winners of the awards, and we thank you for being here today to celebrate their achievements. And on that note, I will remind you before we adjourn that the authors will be outside in the lobby with their, oh, they'll be, a, where? Meeting. meeting room. They'll be in the meeting room uh, with books uh, ready to sign them as soon as you buy them. <laughs> thank you very much for being here.